Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible, hallelujah, is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of praise, joy, and adoration, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Now, I trust that this finds you with a shout on your heart, praise upon your lips, and the spirit of the living God flowing forth from you like rivers of living water. Now, we have just finished our review of the book of Hosea, and today we're going to begin a study in the book of Hebrews. Now, I'm going to consider this a study because we are going to dissect this book and garner every bit of wisdom and insight from it that we possibly can. Now, I will be looking to resources such as commentaries and concordances, but one of the resources I'll be using is from Dr. John MacArthur and his commentary specifically on the book of Hebrews. Now, as we approach this study, it's important for us to understand what the book of Hebrews is, why it was written, and to whom it was written. And so let's begin with a basic understanding of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy, basically are concerning the law of God, what the Jewish people know as the Torah. The books that follow Deuteronomy up until the book of Job are known as historical books. They lay out the history of the early people of Israel. Then we have the wisdom books, which are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Next, we have the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. And then following that, we have the minor prophets. Now, as we move into the New Testament, we have the Gospels, which would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I would consider Acts a Gospel. Then we have the letters that Paul writes unto the early churches known as the Epistles. We also have the letters of Peter, John, and Jude, and then the book of Revelation. But tucked inside of the New Testament are two books known as doctrinal books. Now, the first of these would be the book of Romans, and if you've read the book of Romans, you know how deep it is in truth and doctrine, but along with the book of Romans is the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is just as rich in truth and doctrine, maybe even more so than the book of Romans. And I would have to admit to you that for me, my favorite book in the New Testament is the book of Hebrews. And I trust by the time that we get through with this study, you'll understand why that is, and maybe it will become your favorite book in the New Testament as well. Now, the book of Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians. And when I say Jewish Christians, I want you to fully understand what that means, because they were ostracized. They were persecuted and tortured because they were leaving their heritage, their tradition behind, and they were clinging and taking hold of a new teaching presented by this man known as Jesus of Nazareth. And as many who were trying to conform, comprehend, and understand these new teachings, they found it very difficult to leave their old traditions behind. They were born as Jews. They were raised as Jews. And so their customs were very important to them. And so this is to whom this book is written. Now it's important to understand because it's written to Christians. It is not an evangelistic book. This is a book, a letter that refers to the perseverance of the saints. And so it's a, it's a letter that tells us to stand strong in the most heated of moments under great persecution that could lead to imprisonment or even death. So the book really doesn't focus on how we begin our journey. It focuses on how we end our journey and all the important steps to maintain the right course, the proper course, so that we can reach our ultimate goal, which is to know Jesus Christ, to be loved by Jesus. 
and to spend eternity with him. Now, this letter is written to these early Christians who are probably somewhere around the area of Greece and in the time period of just before the destruction of the temple, which was in 70 AD. Now, many, if not all of these early Christians had never seen or met Jesus. They have come to know what a relationship with Jesus is all about through the teaching of others. More specifically, the prophets of that day, which would be the disciples. Now, of course, they had all the early writings from the Old Testament, but the New Testament had not been written as of yet. Maybe a couple of letters were circulating, but for the most part, they only had the Old Testament to rely upon. Now, the Old Testament had been written by some 40 writers over a period of 1,500 years. And the Almighty had spoken in many ways throughout the Old Testament. That's what we're told in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, God who in sundry times or various times and in divers manners or in different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So God in various ways and in various manners has spoken throughout the course of the Old Testament. Sometimes it was through a vision, sometimes a parable, sometimes a type or a symbol, sometimes through men, sometimes through angels. Sometimes he spoke in narrative, sometimes in poetry, sometimes through the law or prophecy. Sometimes what God had to say was doctrinal. Sometimes it was moral, sometimes it was ethical, sometimes it was warning, and sometimes it was encouragement. But God spoke, as we are told in verse 1, at many different times and in many different ways. You see, just as children are taught by first learning letters, then words, then sentences, so God reveals truth to us line upon line, here a little, there a little. And that's what we see throughout the New Testament, building to the time of Jesus and culminating through the person of Jesus, who is the perfect picture of truth. And that's what Hebrews is going to illustrate to us. John MacArthur says in his commentary, the Old Testament had been given in pieces. To Noah was revealed the quarter of the world from which Messiah would come. To Micah, the town where he would be born. To Daniel, the time of his birth. To Malachi, the forerunner who would come before him. To Jonah, his resurrection was typified. Every one of these pieces of revelation was true and accurate, and yet each one built upon the other's truth. So as these young early Christians are beginning to identify with the person of Jesus and understand that he is the fulfillment of all the promises throughout the Old Testament, they are facing great danger in doing so. And they are being reminded by the writer of the book of Hebrews not to take on their old ways of judicial ceremony and legalism and confuse that with the gospel. Now, in just mentioning the writer of the book of Hebrews, we don't know who that is, so I will not speculate. There are those who believe it could have been Paul. There are those who believe it could have been Peter. There are those who would believe that it could have been Barnabas. But the writer really isn't important. The most important thing is the central figure in the book of Hebrews, and that is the person of the Lord Jesus. And we will see him as man, we will see him as priest, and we will see him as king, high and gloriously lifted up and exalted by the Father, bringing salvation to all who would adhere to his teachings. Now, it's also important to understand that the book of Hebrews is written to Christians, but it addresses all the stages of Christianity that we go through. It it speaks to the babes of Christ. It speaks to those who are in adolescence. It speaks to the more mature, and it speaks to the fully mature. And we need to identify to which stage it's speaking of 
as we progress through its pages. Yet it seems as if every one of them were having a problem with leaving the temple worship and rituals behind. As John MacArthur says, they had gone beyond Judaism in receiving Jesus Christ, but understandably, they were tempted to hang on to many of the Judaistic habits that had been so much a part of their lives. They knew they had a new and better covenant with new and better priesthood, a new and better sanctuary, and a new and better sacrifice. But as John chapter 12 tells us, they believed in Jesus, but they loved the approval of men more than the approval of God. And so as hopefully this information has helped us in understanding who the book of Hebrews is to and why it was written, let us again read verse 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now let me pause for a moment and ask you a question. Do you understand the difference between the prophet and the priest? The prophet is the one who speaks to men on behalf of God. The priest is one who speaks to God on behalf of men. The prophet takes God's message to men. The priest takes man's problems to God. And so it is not the priest whom God is using, but it is his prophets. Those we read about in the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Joshua, and others. It says he has spoken by the prophets in these last days. Now, last days to the Jewish ear were the days of the promised one, the days of the Messiah. And so it's referencing that we are not building towards something, but that it has been built. You see, the priest of old was constantly busy within the temple performing the duties and the things of God. But Jesus, the great priest, has sat down at the right hand of God. He has said, it is finished. The work is done. And so from the moment that Jesus set foot upon planet earth, we began the last days. And we've been in those last days for the last 2,000 years. And that's what he says here. In these last days, he has not spoken unto us by his prophets, but he's spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom he made all the worlds. You see, friends, it's all about Jesus. He is better than any Old Testament person. He is better than any Old Testament institution. He is better than any Old Testament ritual, than any Old Testament sacrifice. He is superior to everyone and everything. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Again, John MacArthur says in his commentary, the book of Hebrews is a kind of summary of the whole epistle in the first three verses. We see that Jesus is superior to everyone and everything. Next, we see that he is superior to the angels. Then we see his superiority to Moses, then to Joshua, then to Aaron and his priesthood, to the old covenant, to the old sacrifices. This is the outline and the flow of the book, which above all else teaches the total, complete, and absolute superiority of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus came in humanity so that we might put on divinity. He became the Son of Man so that we can become sons of God. Dr. MacArthur continues by saying he was born contrary to the laws of nature. He lived in poverty. He was reared in obscurity. And only once did he cross the boundary of the land in which he was born. He had no wealth or influence. He had neither training nor education in the world's schools. His relatives were inconspicuous and influential. In infancy, he startled the king. In boyhood, he puzzled the learned doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows and hushed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitudes without medicine. 
and he made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet all the libraries of the world could not hold all the books about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme for more songs than all songwriters together. He never founded a college, yet all the schools together cannot boast of as many students as he has. He never practiced medicine, and yet he's healed more broken hearts than all the doctors have healed broken bodies. Jesus Christ is the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion and the lamb of zoology, the harmonizer of all discords, and the healer of all diseases. Throughout history, great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave, praise God, could not hold him. All friends, through this book of Hebrews, through this study, you're going to see a glimpse of Jesus that maybe you have never seen before. And your heart is going to be lifted to such heights of praise that you'll find it difficult to walk with a frown upon your face any longer. We serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is high and lifted up. He is Jesus, hallelujah, whose name means salvation, the answer for all men who will only bow in humble surrender unto him, before him, and confess him as God and King. Well, we're going to close here this morning, friends, and I know the introduction has been a little lengthy, but it was vitally important as we approach the study of Hebrews. I'm going to leave you with a video that might better explain to you who Jesus is and why you need to know him. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. Enjoy this video, and I'll see you next time. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age, he rewards the diligent, and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. Is limitless, his mercy is everlasting, his love never changes, his word is enough, his grace is sufficient, his reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him, for yet he's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's invincible, he's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You think you can't.
can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. 